Take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And in just a moment, I'll begin reading to you in verse 20. Mark chapter 11, verse 20. Have you ever had a problem, but you were too proud or whatever to ask anybody to help you? Anybody out there besides me? I can do this when I know I can't really do it, but I don't want to ask for help. I saw a video of a little girl who couldn't strap her car seat, but she refused to let anybody help her, even her daddy. And she would say to him, you worry about yourself. (laughs) That's just too cute for you not to see it, so watch the video, all right. Worry about yourself. Why about yourself? Can I help? No. I help. I don't. You can help when we're out to eat, okay? You can help when we are out to eat. Okay. Do you have, okay. do you have this to see? Probably. You want me to help, Rose? No. Thank you. No, thank you. What do you want me to do? Why about yourself? <laughs> Why about yourself? <laughs> I'll do this one, so I'm uh, gonna do that. You drive! <laughs> Why about yourself? Go drive! <laughs> Go! <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know a lot of Christians like that. They wouldn't ask the Lord to help them for do anything. They wouldn't ask somebody else to help them. You know, we're supposed to be a body. We ought to help one another. We ought to minister to each other, and we ought to minister to the world. The best way you you can witness to a lost person is to do something for them that they need, and that will provide the pathway to share the gospel. When somebody reaches out in love trying to help somebody, and they say, don't worry about me, I'm fine, worry about yourself. Understand that they need you more than anybody else. We need one another, don't we? Maybe that's you. Maybe you think you're self-sufficient. Maybe you think that, hey, I've got money in the bank. I'm good to go, Brother Steve. I've got good health. I got a great family. And you're rocking along, and then all of a sudden, boom. It's like you get knocked off the horse. You keep breathing, you're going to face a mountain. I want to talk to you today about mountain moving faith. Let's talk about that. Mountain moving faith. Mark chapter 11, verse 20. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw a fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Let's all say that together. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them, and they will be granted to you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is in heaven, will also forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your transgressions. How do we walk in faith? What's that look like? What does it mean to walk in truly trusting the Lord? Trusting in the Lord, leaning not on our own understanding. What does that mean? Well, you know I'm going to give you three things, all right? First of all, 
If you want mountain moving faith, speak in faith. How many of you have something in your lives right now that you would love for the Lord to remove? Anybody out there? All right. Now don't point to somebody, all right? Just (laughs) raise your hand, all right. We've all got things. We're all dealing with stuff, and we don't like it, and we want God to do something about it. How do we start off? We've got to speak in faith. Look at verse 20. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up, being reminded. Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. You say, what's all this about? How did the fig tree die? If you read just a little bit farther back in Mark chapter 11 and verse 12, it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, looking around at everything he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, He became hungry, seeing from a distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. He cursed a barren fig tree. Why in the world would he do that? It even says it wasn't in season. Why would he do that? There's something besides a fig tree going on here. Fig trees, olive trees, grape vineyards, they all multiple times in the Bible refer to the Jews. And Jesus had come as the Messianic prophet, the great Messiah, the anointed one. And most of the Jews of that day, just like most of the Jews nowadays, rejected Jesus as the Christ. It's really something. You can be praying for something, and if you don't understand what the Bible's talking about, and if you've just got a a prejudice in your heart, When your answer walks right up to you, you'll say, that's not my answer. God answers in different ways. That's why we call him God, amen? The Old Testament is full of times when God would curse his disobedient people, the Jewish people. Jeremiah 8, verse 13, I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine, no, read it with me, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf will wither. And what I've given them will pass away. That right there, he's talking about Jerusalem, he's talking about Judah, he's talking about the Jewish people who have turned their backs on God. Jeremiah went on to say in Jeremiah 24, verse 8, but like the bad figs, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness. Indeed, thus says the Lord, so will I abandon Zedekiah, king of Judah, all his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem, he who remain in this land and the ones who dwell in the land of Egypt. God says, I'm going to take down the fig tree. I'm taking down the nation of Judah. Hosea said the same thing. Interestingly, by the way, the word Joshua is, and Hosea is the same word for Jesus in the Old Testament. Hosea 9.10 9.10 says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits of, on the fig tree in its first season. You were like figs on a fig tree for me. So when Jesus curses the barren fig tree, he's not just cursing a tree. What he's saying is, I didn't come here to enhance Judaism. I came here to start a new movement out of Judaism that's called Christianity, based on Christ. And now the only religion that can save you is the religion, if you want to call it that, the relationship that you get when you become a Christian and you fall in love with the true Messiah that they rejected, and that's the only way to heaven. The only way to heaven. 
If you don't know Jesus, you're not a Christian, and you're not going to heaven, and you don't have heaven in your soul. You can read this, you can read that, you can read the Torah, you can read all kinds of books that you want to that are extra besides the Bible, but if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got no chance. The Bible goes on to say in verse 22, so Jesus answered them and said, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now you can go up to Gatlinburg, look at every mountain you want to, and try to make it move, I just kind of doubt that it will. He's using an illustration here. Mountains are problems. Say that with me. Mountains are problems. Problems that we encounter day by day. Anybody ever have a problem? Lift all your feet and everything. Amen. We've got problems. Everybody's got problems. So what are you going to do? Well, I can't move it. I'll just live with it. I don't want to live with a problem. I want to deal with it, don't you? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have faith in God, and I'm going to start speaking to the mountain. Speaking to the mountain. Speaking to the problem. Yes, you're to pray about your problems. I'm not saying that, about your mountains. But you're also to speak to your mountain. Directly talk to it. Some of you may not know, but I've got cancer. And I talk to my cancer every day. And I tell it to leave in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I don't ask it to leave because I didn't invite it in. I tell it to leave. Then I quote scripture after scripture. You say, you've lost your mind. No, I'm in my sound mind. Because I believe that God's going to remove it. And I, every time, every day, I, I say, Lord, I speak to the mountain, the problem of cancer. I command every cell of cancer in my body to wither, to die, to leave my body in Jesus' name. You say, I've never heard anything like that. Well, it's right there. Whatever you say, however you speak. Mountain of fear, leave me. Mountain of discouragement, leave me. Mountain of gluttony, leave me. Mountain of alcoholism, leave me. Mountain of anger, leave me. Mountain of cancer, leave me. In Jesus' name, by His shed blood, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, leave me now in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a little embarrassed, just whisper it. Those strongholds will hear you. The Bible says that words are important and they have power for good or evil. David said in Psalm 141 verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. How many of you have let the guard off of your mouth sometimes and said things you shouldn't say? All right. The rest of you did. You just don't want to admit it. All right. (laughs) Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Solomon said in Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, but I tell you that every careless word, every unneeded word, every unnecessary word, every foolish, sinful word, that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Paul went on to say in Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word. You know what that means? Garbage words. That's that's the Greek word for garbage. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. That's building up according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. And then James, you got so much about the tongue in James, you could read the whole book. But he said in James 3, verse 3 and following, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 10, 
If you want to enjoy life, see many days. Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. You ever heard of the old things? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. I've been hit by people when I was playing football, especially. I don't get in fights all the time if you're worried about that. But, <laughs> but I've been hit before. I know what that feels like. I, I just want to say to you that the words that you speak are more powerful, far more powerful than anything else in your life. If you want a good life, speak good words. Speak words of faith over yourself, Christ-honoring words, kind words, encouraging words, joyful words. Why? Have faith in God. Is it on the screen there? Yeah, there? Read it with me. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Right now, right now, close your eyes and ask God to help you with your speech in 2024. Ask him right now. I'm going to do it here. You do it as well. Ask God to help you talk right. In Jesus' name, and if you agree, say amen. 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 Well, what else about moving mountains? What else do I need to know? You don't just need to speak in faith. You need to pray in faith. You say, well, that's speaking. Yes, but it's speaking to God now. Verse 24, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. One of the greatest promises in all the Bible. It's also one of the most ignored verses in the Bible. Jesus said it. Paul said it. Pray about everything. Pray about everything. Jesus qualified that by saying when we pray, we must pray in faith. It's not good enough just to pray. You've got to pray in faith. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. God doesn't want you to worry all the time. And I can hear somebody saying right now, well, that's just the way I am. Well, stop it. If that's the way you are, that's not good. You say, well, my mom and dad were that way. Well, that's not good either. I had parents that grew up in the Depression, and my dad worried all the time, all the time. If you're worrying all the time, it's because you're not tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You're sinning when you worry all the time. And I'm telling you, that's what's wrong with a lot of people's health. That's part of it at any rate. Because when you worry, your whole system gets out of place. God doesn't just want us to worry. He wants us to pray. Matthew 6, 25, for this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food, than food and the body more than clothing? And then he would follow that just a few verses later with a famous verse, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Do you trust the Lord? Trust Him for salvation, yes, but do you trust Him for daily lives, all the actions you have in your daily life? The author of Hebrews said in Hebrews eleven six, one of my favorite verses on faith, without faith it's impossible to please God. Let's say that together. Without faith it's impossible to believe, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. And you're not just talking to some force out there. You're talking to a, a being, an eternal, superior being. You're talking to God, the Creator. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is. You've got to believe in God or there's no reason to pray. And when you don't pray, you're acting like an atheist. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that, now watch this, it's going to really blow some of your minds. He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. Can I let you in on a little secret? God doesn't treat everybody the same way. God blesses people who pray more than He does people who don't pray. God blesses people who speak the Word of God and speak the truth of God more than He does people who don't. With all due respect, I love everybody. But I don't want to be, I don't ever envy a lost person. I don't care how much money they have, what they look like, how great their family looks, how big their house is and all that. You know what? If they don't have Jesus, they've got zero. Zero. That's all they've got. It's impossible to please God if you don't seek Him. He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. God rewards people who pray in faith more than He does those who don't pray in faith. I remember when I was in college, I don't know why a lot of people went to college. One of my main reasons is I wanted to marry somebody. (laughs) I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I dated some girls. But they never, it never ended out right. But in time, God had a plan for me, Donna Joe Dodds. When I got home for, from after our first date, I, if, if I could have done a backflip, I would have done it, all right? Because <laughs> I knew, I knew, that's it. She's the one. And do you know what her favorite verse is? Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able. Everybody say, God is able. able. To do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. That's our prayers. According to the power that works within us, to him be the glory. Say it with me now. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. To all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's give him praise in the house of God today. Amen. Hallelujah. Pray big prayers to a big God. I love Jeremiah. Verses, chapter 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. You want mountain, you want to move the mountains, you want to move the problems in your life? Set a guard over your mouth. Keep watch over the door of your lips. Don't just blurt words out all the time. Can I just make a confession here? That's one of the hardest things I deal with because I just like, I just like to talk to people. I t- if I'm on an airplane, Donald will say, you are not working for Delta. You don't have to greet everybody that comes on the plane. You're not working for them, Steve. I said, well, they're right by me. They're standing right there and I'm looking at them. I can't just say hi. Not all of them. Well, okay. Then I do it anyway, right? That's right. I hear you chuckling down there, right? Yeah. It's wonderful to believe the Bible. It's wonderful to think biblical thoughts. And it's wonderful to speak biblical words. And if you're going to please God, if you're going to move mountains, you need to pray in faith. If you want to move mountains, you want mountain moving faith, you have to speak in faith, you have to pray in faith. But one more thing, you have to forgive in faith. I just heard the gasps all over the room. Can we go back to the speaking and the praying? No. 
Look at verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. If you have anything against anyone, that's pretty broad, is it not? If you have anything against anyone, forgive them. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. How many of you want to be forgiven? I got my hands up. You can't be forgiven. Even if they've done something terrible to you. You don't look. No, you don't have to keep putting yourself in a position for them to hurt you. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, if you have to get away from them, that's fine. You do what the Lord tells you to do. But forgive them. You know why? Because if you don't forgive them, it's not them who are going to be in bondage. It's you. And God doesn't want His children in bondage. He wants to set us free. Amen? Amen. He wants us to walk in freedom. You can't be free unless you forgive. You can't do it. Forgive them like, like your Father in heaven also may forgive you for your transgressions. If you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions. You can speak in faith to mountains and they won't move. You can pray in faith and your mountain won't move if you don't also combine this with those other two and just make a mental list and say, God, I forgive. I forgive, and I forgive them, Lord. I forgive them. Call them out by name. You know, I'll be driving along sometimes, and God will just remind me, because I've, I've told the Lord, I, I, don't want, I don't want to keep any unforgiveness in my life. I don't want any of it. And sometimes I'm driving along, and God will just remind me of something, something that happened. And I, get, I feel that little thing coming up like, Ah, I'm going to go deal with that. Like the Lord said, deal with it right here. Forgive them. Just forgive them. But what if they're not repentant? That's not your business. You repent, you, you repent of that. You forgive them. Just forgive them. Again, don't, if it's abusive, don't put yourself under it. But forgive them. I've seen Christians wanting forgiveness, but they couldn't get it because they had never forgiven the person who wronged them. I don't know how many times I've talked to adult children that when they were a child, their parents yelled at them and screamed at them, or they were bullied by somebody at school. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people whose teenagers were rebellious, and rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. It's demonic. And they've ruined their homes, and parents have a hard time forgiving them. People get hooked on drugs, and we're just saying, why can't you just stop that? Why can't you stop drinking and getting drunk? You turn into another person when you get drunk. Why do we have to live with this? And it's okay to confront them about that. At the same time, deep in your heart, you've got to give them to God. How do you give them to God? Forgive them. See, when you forgive them, you're out of the picture. How many of you believe God is a lot more exacting judge than we could ever be? Does anybody believe that? Just, just give them to God. Cast your cares upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. In his book, Lee, The Last Years, Charles Bacalan Flood reported that after the Civil War, General Robert E. Lee, who fought for the Confederacy, had a brief conversation with a very wealthy woman in Kentucky. The lady took him out, and she started crying because of a tree that had been blown up by a northern can cannon, and she's sitting there with this top general of the Confederate Army, and she wanted him to say something negative about the people up north. 
She's crying about a dead tree. And Lee looked at her and he said, ma'am, I've got just one thing to say. Forgive them, let it go, and move on. Forgive them, let it go, move on. Say it with me. Forgive them, let it go, move on. How many of you would like to do that today? Anybody? Just in your heart. You know, you know who it is. You know who it is. Just say, I'm going to forgive them in Jesus' name. I'm going to let them go and let God handle it. I want to live in mountain-moving faith. I want to live every day with great faith. I want to live trusting God. May our motto be, I will live believing, I will not die doubting. Do you know that 2023 is just a few hours away of being over? It's time to decide. No matter what you're going through. What do you plan to do in 2024? I can tell you what I'm planning on doing. I'm planning on asking the Lord to help me speak in faith. I'm going to ask the Lord to help me pray in faith. I'm going to ask God to help me forgive in faith. And if I do those three things, Jesus said, a mountain is going to move when you do it my way.